One of the shocking news in recent times is the appearance of terrible disasters by Mother Nature in the Kaaba. Floods, storms, or even locust attacks on this sacred site. Not stopping there, the terrible hailstorm made Muslims afraid of the messages God was trying to say. Is it a sign of God's anger and punishment? Things become especially more complicated with questions about the presence of the Ark of the Covenant during natural disasters. What is the real meaning behind this natural phenomenon? Does it threaten our present life? Let's join this expedition to find the truth at this sacred site. Hail devastates Kaaba, terrifying Muslims. Hail storms, particularly ones striking the Kaaba, are seen as potential divine signs and reminders of God's judgment and the anticipation of the return of the Son of God. Not only that, the hailstorm strikes Kaaba, prompting speculation about its deeper meaning and the presence of the Ark of the Covenant during intense natural disasters. The physical temple was destroyed, but God's true dwelling remains in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant is observed in heaven rather than on earth, signifying God's presence and favor extending beyond physical boundaries. Recent hailstorms at the Kaaba may hold profound significance. Hailstorms are seen as signs from God, serving as a reminder to be vigilant and prepared for His return, with recent speculation about the significance of a hailstorm at the Kaaba. A hailstorm at the Kaaba sparks debate over divine signs versus natural occurrence, with diverse interpretations of its significance. The Ark of the Covenant was the place of presence. While the Lord was present among His people in the Exodus, He localized this presence in the tabernacle for the benefit of His sinful people. The tabernacle was constructed so that the Lord would be among His people, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. But in an even more specific way, the ark served as the place of the presence of God. As we read in Exodus 25, 22, there I will meet with you on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you. Here is such a mind-blowing idea about the God of the Bible that we have to pause for a moment. The eternal God who is not constrained by the existence of time, the infinite God who is not bound by the constraints of space, the transcendent God who dwells above and beyond all time and space, and the immense God who fills all time and space condescended to the weakness of His people and became manifest for their benefit in one locale. This God is not bound by time, but He bound Himself to the time-bound experience of His people. This God is not bound by space, but He bound Himself to this box. He is above all creational constraints, but He bound Himself to them. He is everywhere, but He was there. He chose to stoop very low and to humble himself very far for the sake of his wandering people in the wilderness. Even more, he chose to stoop and to humble himself for us in his Son, Jesus Christ, and then to stoop as low as death. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Phil, we are 2, 8. The fact that the Ark was the place of the Lord's presence among His people brought great assurance to the people of God. This high, lofty, majestic, and resplendent King dwelt among His grumbling, complaining, bickering, and sinful people. Does that sound familiar? We too are grumbling, complaining, bickering, and sinful people. Thankfully, God is not far off in another land, but He is near to us who are sinners. The promise to the New Covenant believer is that the Lord is near to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us, even as Jesus promised His helpful presence. The assurance His nearness brings was described by the prophet Isaiah much later in this history of salvation. Just as God accompanied Israel when they wandered in a wilderness, so too He was with them in the days of their restoration from exile. Thus, the prophet said, in all their affliction he was afflicted, Isa 63, 9. 
Much has been made of the symbolism of the Ark, and rightfully so. Suffice it to say that every aspect of the Ark pointed to Jesus. The acacia wood symbolizes our Lord's humanity. The gold overlay denoted his deity. The Ten Commandments and the Pentateuch inside the Ark pictured Jesus with the law of God in his heart, living in perfect obedience to it. The pot of manna spoke of Jesus as the bread of life, or our life sustainer. Aaron's rod that budded obviously prophesied the resurrection. The mercy seat was also a symbol that pointed to the Messiah. It was representative of the fact that the work of Jesus on the cross would cover the law of God with his mercy, making it possible for those who put their faith in Jesus to be reconciled to God. It is an illustration of how the divine throne was transformed from a throne of judgment into a throne of grace by the atoning blood that was sprinkled on it. In the Bible, hail is often used as a metaphor for God's judgment on sin and unbelief. It is seen as a sign of God's power and a warning to those who disobey his commands. Hail is a sign of judgment. The book of Exodus recounts the plagues that God sent upon Egypt to convince Pharaoh to release the Israelites from slavery. One of those plagues was hail, which destroyed crops, killed livestock, and damaged buildings. In Exodus 9.18, 19, God says to Moses, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast, which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Similarly, in the book of Revelation, hail is described as part of the wrath of God that will be poured out on the earth during the end times. Revelation 16.21 says, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. While hail is often associated with destruction and judgment, it is also seen as a sign of God's power and sovereignty. In the book of Joshua, hail is used as a weapon in battle. Joshua 10.11 says, And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Betharon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Similarly, in the book of Job, God uses hail as an example of his control over nature. Job 38, 22, 23 says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? As we have seen, hail is often used in the Bible as a symbol of God's judgment and power. However, it also has other symbolic meanings that are worth exploring. Despite its association with destruction and judgment, hail can also be seen as a symbol of God's faithfulness to his people. In the book of Psalms, hail is described as one of the ways in which God shows his love for his creation. Psalm 148, 8 says, Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Similarly, in the book of Isaiah, hail is used as a metaphor for the blessings that God bestows on his people. Isaiah 32, 19 says, And it shall hail coming down on the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. In some cases, hail is used as a symbol of the repentance that is necessary to avoid God's judgment. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet describes a vision of God's glory that includes a storm of hail and fire. Ezekiel 13.11, 13 says, Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye 
O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in my anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Here the hail is a warning to those who have built their lives on a false foundation. It is a call to repentance, and a reminder that only God's grace can save us from His judgment. In conclusion, hail is a powerful symbol in the Bible that is used to represent both God's judgment and His power. It is a warning to those who disobey His commands, but it is also a sign of His faithfulness and a call to repentance. As we seek to understand the meaning of hail in the Bible, we should remember that it is ultimately a symbol of God's sovereignty over all of creation. So now let's think about the hailstorm in Kaaba. Terrifying things happened that worried Muslims. Are there any messages that Jesus wants to send about his second coming? Matthew 24, 36 says that, Keep on watching and be ready for Christ's return. Only the Father knows when Jesus will return. Jesus stated clearly and emphatically that no one knows the day and hour when he will return except his heavenly Father. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Matthew 24, 36. The return of Jesus Christ is near, even at the door, like a thief in the night. He may come through the door any moment, but let's make it very clear, no one knows that day or hour. History is littered with individuals who think they know more than Jesus. Yesterday was no exception, and there will be more who will come out of the closet before Christ returns. God the Father did not leave the door ajar for some arrogant Bible student with a calculator or computer or some Bible code through whom to reveal the date of Jesus' return. He emphatically said, No one knows the day or the hour when I shall return. Only the Father knows, and He has chosen not to reveal the day or hour. Jesus Christ will return to gather His elect and judge the world, because we do not know when that time will be, therefore we must be ready. Date fixing is eliminated with Jesus' statement. That day and hour no one knows. Moreover, no one clearly states the impossibility of any human or angel discovering by whatever means when the day and hour of his return. Date fixing is absolutely impossible. No one in the whole human race will ever know ahead of time when Jesus is coming. It is completely out of the realm of human knowledge. Jesus stated not even the angels of heaven know the date or time of Jesus' return. The time of Jesus' coming is not even discussed in heaven, but of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Mark 13, 32. Then who is in the know? The Father alone knows when Jesus will return. The precise time no one knows, but the Father only. The comprehensive statement of Jesus makes it explicitly clear that no human being on this earth will ever know the time of Jesus' appearance until every eye shall behold him. Robertson notes, It is clear that Jesus has in mind the time of his second coming. He had plainly stated in verse 34 that those events would take place in that generation. He now as pointedly states that no one but the Father knows the day or the hour when the second coming and the end of the world will come to pass. We are to pray and watch for His coming. We are commanded to watch continually for the coming of Christ. In the context of Matthew 24, 36, Jesus spoke of a series of events that will precede His return, but the precise moment of that great event has not been revealed to anyone. The Father alone knows the time, and in His infinite wisdom, 
he has chosen not to reveal it. The angels stand in a very close relationship with God the Father and will be associated with Christ's return, but they too do not know the hour of his coming. Matt 13, 41, 24, 31. What the angels do know is this. Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Acts 1, 9, 11. No day is named that every day may be hallowed by the sense of the possibility of its being the day of his advent. It helps to hallow each day of life to realize that before it closes, we may be in the presence of Christ's glory. Jesus will come unexpectedly, Matt 24, 37, 44. Jesus illustrated this with the illustration of Noah's flood. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37, 39. Men will not be thinking about his coming when it arrives. They will be preoccupied with their own pursuits of life, as in the time of Noah. They refused to heed the warnings of God. Only those who are prepared will escape the sudden and unexpected destruction. It will be with suddenness that Jesus will appear. What will be the condition of the world when he returns? Jesus and his disciples writing in the New Testament make it very clear there will be total depravity, exceeding wickedness, and even apostasy in the church when he comes back. It will be an evil day. Jesus will be despised and hated by the vast majority of people all over the world. It will be like in the days of Noah. Are you ready for Jesus' coming? Intimate associations will be separated by the unexpected coming of Jesus. Furthermore, Jesus said, Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Matthew 24, 40, 41. The coming of the Lord Jesus will be clearly manifest. There will be no need for prophets to announce the fact that he has come or invite men to come and see him. Every eye will behold him. And then it is too late to believe in Christ as your savior. The Bible does not teach annihilation or universalism. It does state clearly that mankind has a simple choice. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Your eternal destiny depends upon that personal decision. Not everyone will be saved. You must believe in Jesus Christ or be eternally lost and separated from a holy God in hell. Are you ready? Be ready for Jesus' coming. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, 42. Be constantly on the alert. Keep your eyes open. Keep wide awake. Be watchful or vigilant means to live a sanctified life, consciously aware of the coming judgment day. The just shall live by faith in Jesus Christ. The true believer is looking forward to the coming of the bridegroom and king. The picture is the coming of our glorious, powerful king, clothed with authority and majesty. You do not know on what day your Lord is coming. He compares himself to a burglar in the night. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, while they are saying, peace and safety. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, 
that the day would overtake you like a thief. The stress of the whole passage in Matthew is you must be ready for Jesus' coming because he will come when you do not expect him. No one knows at what time or during what watch the thief will come. Therefore, keep on watching. Be ready. No one can predict when he will come. Jesus admonishes us, be ready. Be on the alert. You do not know when the thief will come, but he is coming. Are you prepared in mind and heart? Are you ready for his coming? Keep in mind the words of the Apostle Peter when he wrote, You should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. The current false date setting by the cults only throws more fuel on the fire of the mockers of evangelical Christianity. Yes, the day of judgment will come. It is appointed by God, who is a righteous sovereign. Let me share with you how you can be right with God. God loves you and wants you to experience his peace and life. He desires to have a lasting intimate love relationship with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loves you so much that he sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Christ did this by paying the penalty of our sins when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But you know what? We have a severe problem. We are separated from God because we choose to disobey him. Our problem is serious. We are not capable of saving ourselves. We are so sinful that we cannot reach up to God. He is holy and we are depraved sinners. You see, that is exactly why God sent his son to die in our place. God is offering you the free gift of salvation or eternal life. It is a gift that was paid in full by Jesus Christ when he died in your place on the cross. You can do nothing to merit it or earn it. To try to pay for it is an insult to the grace of God. Will you turn from your sins and unbelief and by faith receive Jesus Christ into your heart and life? You can use the following prayer if it comes from your heart. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that I cannot save myself. I now believe that Christ died in my place on the cross in order to forgive me of my sins. I know that Christ rose from the dead and lives today. I confess my sins to you, and I repent and put my faith in you to save me. I want you to save me for all eternity. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Amen. I don't believe Jesus is returning tomorrow, but it sure seems closer than ever. Like an airplane making its initial descent to its final destination, we are on the downward trajectory leading to the Lord's glorious return. This period might be a decade, two decades, or even longer. Either way, there's an urgency to get ready for the greatest time of glory and upheaval in world history. Just as the ark was designed to be a symbol of the presence of God in the midst of his people, Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's love and care and presence. He is our ark. He is our law. He is our manna. He is our budded rod. And thank God, he is our mercy seat. Humans desire to predict and imagine our future, whether that be the prospect of heaven or the demise of our entire planet. We are great consumers of eschatological texts, books, films, and television programs which foresee our collective end abound. And yet today, when we know ourselves to be closer to the abyss than ever before, through climate change and myriad other human-made planet-destroying processes, we seem unwilling to engage with eschatology in Scripture. Perhaps this is because we look to Scripture for comfort. 
God will save us in what sometimes seems like a world headed for disaster. In fact, Revelation has much to offer us too. The seer knows, as we are coming to know, that the time is short. That's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to watch the latest videos from us. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.